Welcome to Namaste Motherfuckers, the only podcast where the worlds of comedy, self-help and business collide. I'm your host, Callie Beaton, and today's episode is called Life Lessons from the Labour Party. Politics, said Ernest Ben, is the art of looking for trouble, finding it, whether it exists or not, diagnosing it incorrectly and applying the wrong remedies. That sounds about right. Or in the words of Jay Leno, politics is just show business for ugly people. Back when being kind wasn't a thing. My guest today joined the Labour Party the first day that he was legally allowed to, on his 15th birthday. A study in July 2013 found that more people in Britain believed in ghosts than supported the Labour Party. But we've moved on since then. In 2021, more people believe that vodka can be used as hand sanitizer than support the Labour Party. Maybe that's just me. My guest went on to work for the party for many years and left the day Jeremy Corbyn became leader. In ancient Rome, it was considered a sign of leadership to be born with a crooked nose. Nowadays, it's considered a sign of leadership to have gone to Eton, father children left and right, well, mainly right, and have a zero tolerance policy towards soft furnishings from John Lewis. If you've just discovered this podcast episode in 2022 or beyond, that last reference will make no sense whatsoever. But thank you for supporting the podcast. What an amazing backdrop you've got. Oh, and it's not even virtual, Matt. I'm just a legend. That's what it is. That's so cool. Gold disc. That's my guest today. Comedian, satirist, writer and presenter, Matt Ford. Among his many talents, Matt is the voice of Boris Johnson, Keir Starmer and Donald Trump on Spitting Image. He's not the voice of David Furnish, despite me telling him during our conversation, with so much conviction that he began to question it himself, that he is. I just haven't put anything <laughs> on that wall yet. I'd love to claim that it was deliberate, but uh, it's not. I like it. I like it to be a metaphor for our lives at the moment, a blank. <laughs> Matt's career's going all right. You'll have seen him on Have I Got News For You, Mock The Week, 8 Out Of 10 Cats and Question Time, among many other appearances. And he's even been on the Royal Variety Show. He's a regular radio host and had his own political comedy show on Dave, Unspun, with Matt Ford. Matt also has a monthly residency, which is also released as a podcast, The Political Party, which regularly sells out Westminster's The Other Palace. Past guests have included Tony Blair, Alistair Campbell, Nigel Farage and George Galloway. Basically, he's a political showbiz genius. Matt and I talked about his time in the Labour Party, leadership, comedy, Jackie Weaver, the Blair years, single mums, doing impressions, Oasis, Billy Connolly and Bin Laden wanking. Yes, that is what I said. But I started by asking him about his book, Politically Homeless. I think I say this in the book. I never thought I was the sort of person who would write one. And uh, I guess just always presumed that I wouldn't. But I think in this line of work, it, you realise that actually it, it might be an opportunity you'll get and it's a good thing to think about. And I think I'm just very lucky that at a time when a lot of people were feeling the same, I was in a position to articulate my personal take on why politics, particularly in Britain, had become so repellent. And I'm very lucky that before I was a comedian and, and all the other things, I had worked in politics. I had a lot of personal experience to share, a lot of it positive, some of it negative. And I thought I could make it funny. So um, I, I guess it was pure fate. Really, I, I, I'm just very lucky that I'd lived my life in a particular order. And by the time the country had reached a point, I was able to write a book about how I think a lot of people felt. So the, just the honest answer is pure chance and luck, really. What came first, the uh, the country on its knees or uh, lockdown and you thinking, oh, I'll write a book? I'm assuming you'd started it before lockdown. 
No, I, I wrote it during lockdown. You did. Well, yeah, that was so... we all said we were going to. You went and bloody well did it, you <laughs> bastard. <laughs> but I think it had kind of been in the air before then, and then it, it, it probably would have happened around a similar time. The great, um, I guess, one of the few positives of lockdown was that it meant that I could just really focus on it. Whereas I think if you're out gigging and stuff, finding the time would be quite difficult. So I just knuckled down and did it. <laughs> did you, I assume you had a deal for it. Not that this is a podcast about how to get a book published, but I assume you had a deal for it before you wrote it, right? You, it wasn't a speculative bit of writing. You, you got, got an advance and a pre-deal. Yes, that's correct. My agent handled all that. So, um, uh, yes. See, the old businesswoman uh, in me is like, what kind of deal did you get? No, I wasn't going to ask yeah. you for, for numbers. I was just thinking in terms of it wasn't a speculative bit of writing. You knew you were writing something that was going to be read, assuming anyone wanted to read it. Yes, I didn't write uh, 60,000 words and then try and get it commissioned. No. <laughs> I thought that was the more sensible. I think maybe it's different. I think depending on the sort of book, actually, and obviously I've written a book so technically I guess I count as an author but not in the same way that someone who writes a novel or whatever where you've got because I think comedy would be more like that where you would consider yourself a storyteller whether you'd got a deal or not because that would be your kind of driving motivation so it's different for people like that I think because then you probably do write it and then try and get it sold in the way that a comedian does the jokes and then tries to progress so um, it was different for me I think given the type of book I guess it was always going to be that way around. And I guess you, you make a living out of comedy and politics insofar as all of your material, pretty much, or certainly all the kind of main things you do, your podcast, the book, the stuff we know you for on telly, it's, it's got politics at its heart. But I was really struck in the book by, and I guess this is what you do for your day job, but how you manage to mine the funny in some really bloody distressing stories. And it was, it, you did really did make me laugh out loud that the Bin Laden wank line, which I think if no one's, if not, hi, mum and dad, I know you'll be listening. Uh, but that's a classic. That made me a snort out my toothpaste. Um, there was, there were a couple of absolute corkers in there, but you manage even in the really dark sort of parts of the book to be funny. I so, said, so what, what is that? like sort of dancing on that kind of tightrope <laughs> well firstly thank you very much because um it means a great deal coming from you and that was the great challenge is how do you write about something how do you get how do you get that balance right between writing a book that without sounding grand has a point to make and just an experience to share that can enlighten people without it being terribly dull and feeling like and this then this happened and then i moved to this office and this is what happened there because I'm a comedian, so it's got to be funny. And I I guess you're right. I, I've had a few years, because I do political comedy, I'm used to getting into a, a flow of, I guess in a way, it's different to stand-up. But I, I applied the same logic, which was, I need to have a laugh every so often. And obviously it has to be appropriate. And in a book, it's different. And I was very conscious, actually, of not wanting it to read like a stand-up routine. And it doesn't. It really doesn't read like okay. a stand-up routine. I mean, it's definitely funny, but there's a hell of a lot of substance in there. I mean, you joke about, you know, you've read this now, you can be, you're, you can go off and be prime minister. Frankly, I think my tortoiseshell cat sitting over there could go off and be a better prime minister. But it did, it really was hugely, ins I did think, because I was reading it, I was like, bloody hell, do you, do I mean, do you do the corporate circuit and stuff? Do you do, you, do, you do loads of stuff for kind of businesses and stuff or not? Not in the same way that I think you do with like sharing insights. I do um and taking money. That's my main ethos. Well, yeah, I, I do um I do corporates in the way that comedians do corporates in that I do 20 minutes of stand-up or host awards and things. I've never done one where it's here's the things I learned in politics and or about leadership and here's you know that more um proper stuff that you yeah do, don't start you know. doing that because that's that you know I wouldn't recommend it I've got that sewn up I wouldn't dare <laughs> no I mean that well but the the sad thing for the likes of me is that if you did you could because some of the things <laughs> that you um some of the things that you talked about it, it was literally I was like this is this is like a study in leadership and bad leadership and bullying and it's so reminded me I've worked at enough massive corporations that no one will know which one I'm talking about but to a T, they've had similar infighting and nastiness and cronyism and crap that makes you want to leave when you're thinking, I'm one of the good guys. I'm here for the right reasons. Why am I leaving? And, and I don't know if this was the case in the Labour Party. So for, for anyone who's been living under a rock, you left the Labour Party when um, Jeremy Corbyn was elected as leader of the Labour Party, right? Was it virtually overnight that you left? 
I left literally the moment he was announced as leader. I emailed the Labour Party and cancelled my membership. Um, I hadn't worked for the party for a while. I stopped working for Labour directly as an employee in 2007, I think, or 2008. And then I, I still then worked in politics. I worked for a Labour politician after that. And then I didn't work directly in politics since the kind of 2010s. Um, but I was still a member of the Labour Party and I'd struggled to stay a member during the Ed Miliband years. But I thought I wanted a say in who the next leader was going to be. And I hoped that Labour was going to make a return to the sensible centre-left. And and it's one of the points I make in the book. I know a lot of people were taken in by Corbyn. A lot of very well-meaning good people were taken mm. in because he talked about hope. And on the face of it, you can totally understand why he energised particular parts of the population that didn't feel that Labour had really spoken to them for mm. a while. However, I dealt with people like him before and I dealt with the hard left and I'd seen how they'd masquerade as you know, morally superior, what their actual agenda was. I was deeply worried about some of the things he'd said horrified by the people he'd hung around with. Mm. And uh, quite apart from anything else, I wanted Labour to be electable. Mm -hmm. And the further Labour goes to the left, the less electable it gets. So it was a whole range of reasons, but I knew who Corbyn was. I knew what he was really about. I was horrified. Mm. I didn't, you know, you could see what was going to happen. And I wanted to play no part. I didn't want to give a single penny to a party that was going to let that man be leader. Was it still shocking when you saw the Panorama documentary? Were you still shocked by the extent of what was actually going on and how bad it had got for some people? I think, yes, because even though you hear the generalities, and I still had friends who worked for the party, so you would hear bits. When you see it laid out, and when you see, and I talk about in the book, a guy called Mike Crichton, who mm. I knew, it wasn't just, I mean, the anti-Semitism was horrendous. And when that, when people are talking about considering suicide and they just weren't taken, it's just horrific. Even if that wasn't a political party, any employer seeing their staff talk like that mm. on Panorama should have been horrified mm. and changed the way it works. Instead, they briefed against these people they doubled down didn't they yeah and then to see people i knew because in a way you leave somewhere you move on and i was a comedian now um i'm an ex-member of staff but i'm a comedian and that's mm. how i see myself to see people i knew and had worked with and around on that thing on that documentary talk about how they've basically been humiliated i mean the whole thing made me feel sick anyway but obviously it, it really took me back to having worked there and how mm. emotionally invested i was in those people and in the cause and it is traumatic it when you see um, one of the things that struck me from I had a sense as a an outsider does as to how toxic it might be within a political party or within politics full stop. But one of the things that struck me that was very much a parallel from my corporate life was that the people who would be rewarded and continue to rise to the top were often people that were so bloody difficult or awful that everyone was like, I'm not taking them on. So they would just have carry on apps. And then the people like me that just did a decent job and tried to be nice, it, no one needed to worry about rewarding me or do, because I mean, I'm not saying I, I was very handsomely rewarded. I'm, I'm not trying to sort of have a sub story, but I, I re towards the end of my time in the corporate world, I do remember thinking unless I become much more of an asshole, I am going to continue to get walked all over and I won't be rewarded because I'm, I, I'm going to try and be obliging and decent. And I just got, I used to sort of square it off by thinking, but I do manage a hell of a lot of people who I do the right thing by. So I thought I'm a decent egg and hopefully they think I am. But then another bit of me thought, I used to sit in board meetings and think, I know the game to play here. I know what I should say, but I honestly can't be asked anymore because it's the same movie, different people. And I'm about to start saying what I actually think. So I don't know if that, it struck me that it was a bit like that, what you talked about the Labour Party, that the arseholes were sort of getting rewarded at a certain point and the people trying to do the right thing were getting sidelined. Is that how it was? Well, from the outside, that's how it looked. Yeah. And, and on a grand scale. I mean, I, I should say as well, when I worked for the Labour Party, I worked with some of the most talented, incredible people whose skills in the private sector would see them generously rewarded. Yeah. And that comes across, I think, that comes across really well in the book. Yeah. Some incredible people and not just the politicians. I mean, some of the politicians were exceptionally gifted and, you know, certainly, I mean, I was working there towards the end of the new Labour period in a very, very small way. But whatever their faults, people like Tony Blair, Alistair Campbell, Peter Mandelson, Gordon Brown were hugely talented individuals. And to feel like you were playing a part in that was, was really, really special, even when it starts to fall apart. But I guess like any organisation, the Labour Party is not immune 
even in the time that I worked there to kind of promoting difficult people to get them out of the way. Yeah, there is, or not, or not stopping them. People who are, it's the people who are willing to manage upwards, aren't they? So people who are absolute dickheads to people to their left and right and below them, but yeah. know what to say to keep having their path upwards. And it's a very, it's a very kind of cynical, but effective strategy. I mean, you're a, so you're, you're a self-confessed Blairite. You've had Blair on, you did a live stream with Blair on your podcast last month. You've had him on your podcast before. So, and you were, what age were you? When, it, when Blair got got in, uh, fourteen. Fourteen, that's aging because I had my first child uh, not long after he got in. So it was a big <laughs> year for me, but different reasons for you. Unless you were a dad that year, in which case, congratulations. <laughs> So it did. Wasn't. So it did. Um, you were asking me what the disc on the wall is behind me, and that's. I was working at MTV. So back then, I worked at MTV. We were doing Unplugged with Oasis. Oh my God, the best MTV Unplugged of all time at the Royal Festival Hall. Yeah, that was, and it was. I was, I was um, pregnant. At that. That's not when I got pregnant. I might add, or not that I remember, but I was. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant, wasn't it? So. So were you there for that gig? I was there. For <gasps> yeah. I mean, there are there are so many Oasis gigs. I wish I was at Nebworth and Main Road. And MTV unplugged. Would yeah, they? that was a very. I mean, I used to go to all the unplugged back then, and all the kind of all the all the cool stuff. Uh, but yeah, that was a very. It, that was one of those ones where you're like, yeah, to my, one, to my, one day my kids might be interested in that story. At the moment, it's great. Like, and obviously, it's, in a way, it's um, it's the best one because it would have been different if Liam would have done it. Like it no one doing would. it, kind of. <laughs> At that time, kind of moved Oasis into a kind of slightly different space. Oh, right? it did. And Oasis I remember was a bit sophisticated. Yeah, we were all so we, we would go along to and, and sometimes they were done in tiny venues and you'd go as somebody who worked on them, you'd it would just be like, you know, like the George Michael one was was really small. Um, but you and then you, I'm not gonna keep not dropping names like that. No, please do there, mate. I want to hear all the stories. But um, yeah, you've met Blair. I'm gonna give you some unplugged stories. But the um, but the this one, so everybody was like queuing around the building, and obviously it's a bit of a bigger venue. Venue, so a lot more people are going to be there and then we were sort of ushered past the queue of people who were just queuing you know people who'd got tickets through whatever other means and then the kind of shock and horror when it became clear that Liam Gallagher for anyone who doesn't know Liam Gallagher didn't show up for the MTV Unplugged and Noel had to front it and then Liam Gallagher did turn up <laughs> to sort of heckle him in the audience so it became an absolutely legendary thing. Couldn't have been better for MTV either back then. And not that they needed the publicity back then when they, they were never almost sort of into, you know, watching music on, on MTV. But yeah, so those, so that whole era for me, as, as somebody who's, you know, 10, 15 years older than you, it felt so incredible. I remember that whole thing of like, you know, that we've got this new government and Labour are in and he's kind of like, he's cool and he hangs out with Oasis. And, and then I had my baby and I remember like walking around with my little baby around Hampstead Heath thinking, oh my God, it's so exciting. And what a brilliant year for Labour to have got in. It's a new start. And it's a shame he fucked it all up really, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the narrative, isn't it? And in a way, it's people think the same of Oasis, you know, is that sort of great hope that was never realised. I, I do think about it differently. And uh, I think they did so much good that obviously Iraq is the thing that, that will It's a little niggle, isn't it? It's just a little niggle. For a lot of people. Mm. And it might not surprise you that I have a more charitable analysis of... Uh, how and why Iraq happened than, 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 than the average person. You wrote to Tony Blair when you were 15 to ask him how you could join. No, when you were 14, is that right? Yeah. To ask how to join the Labour Party and you had to wait a year and then you joined. Yes, I joined um, either on or around my 15th birthday and was delighted to have joined the Labour Party. I was so energised by it. And for the same reasons that a lot of people were at the time. I mean, for people, I can't believe you're older than me, but for people that, are maybe 10 or 15 years older than me. They really remember the Thatcher years vividly. Mm. And Labour had been out of office for 18 years at that point when they won. Mm. And five years earlier, everyone thought they were going to win and they didn't. And at that point, people are saying, is Labour ever going to win again? And look where we are now and the parallels and how long Labour could still potentially mm. be out of office. And you really feel that length of time. Uh, so it just felt like a really hopeful, optimistic time. And I was, uh, I was just really taken taken with it and it just gave me so much hope and I think I'm really lucky that I had such an amazing mum but I grew up in an area where by the age by quite a young age I realised we were disadvantaged compared so to So you relatives. grew up in Nottingham with a in a single parent family but you did have contact with your dad right so you were brought up in, with your mum as the primary carer but you yes. did have a sort of dad as a role model as well. I did well 
You're struggling with around. role model, aren't you? You're wincing. You're like, role model, really? Well, I get on really well with him. I mean, I've never not got on with him, but I remember the day I met him. So he wasn't around for like the formative years and he didn't live in Nottingham. He, he lived away. So he didn't really have any influence on me growing up. I, I'm just very, very lucky that uh, both my mum and my dad are really wonderful people. And they've both, uh, over the course of my life, had a very positive impact on it. But um, really, you know, my mum raised us absolutely on her own. So she did the heavy lifting during the time when the Tories were clamping down on single mums, right? So that Completely, must have yes. been... And I have to say, even now, as I, you know, I've been a single mum most of my kid's life. And even now, I remember that narrative, even though obviously I was not a mum at the time. I'm not that fucking old. But, I, you know, to pick on the to pick on the ones who were left doing the heavy lifting and penalise them for still being there. It, it's absolutely beggar's belief. How we ended up as a society judging the people, mothers on the whole, who were left raising the children. Mm is appalling. And there's still a lot of that out there. There's still a lot of snobbery towards single parents, particularly towards single mums. Mm. And as a kid, I absolutely picked up on it. Not necessarily from the politicians, but from neighbours, from relatives, from people that were around. It was more unusual then, wasn't it? Nowadays, you're kind of the odd one out if your parents haven't had some kind of split up. But in those, I, I know you're not that much younger than me, but it was still more unusual then to be from a single parent family than it is now. Yeah, and Broken Homes was... I mean, in the area that I grew up in, it wasn't that unusual. I really... But, um, your street in Nottingham, you were still, one yeah, of in many. A, in a city, Nottingham, it wasn't that unusual. Um, but particularly when I went to secondary school, you'd hear people talk about Broken Homes, you know, and you just think... Yeah, even that phrase, isn't it? And we call it blended. Our family is a blended family, not a broken so, family. That's so and much better. Yeah, we're wankers. We live in North London, <laughs> we eat quinoa, and we have a blended family. And why not? Why was the focus not on absent fathers? Like, yeah. if you're talking about rights and responsibilities, duties, you don't blame the people that are doing the right thing. That doesn't mean that every parent who isn't around is doing the wrong thing or anything like that. But it was very odd. And I mean, did you... So, so when sexist. you... Yeah, well, really sexist. And there is still a lot of crap around that, definitely. And also opinions about whether you're a working mum. People, and I used to think, well, I'm the only bread. Like, how do you think I'm, how do you it's think a full-time these kids job. are eating? Like, I, no, but, I was, but I mean, as in when you've got a job as well, people are like, well, yeah. you know, you shouldn't be working all hours. It's like, well, I have to, I have to raise the kids. I have to put food on the table. They, well, you they, can't win, can you? Yeah, you because can't if you win. you do work. Yeah, you work, you don't, but all the judgment of it. But when you, when, um, so in terms of new labour getting in, one of the things you say in your book is about them being tough on crime, that that was a really big thing for you because you experienced um, not just one, but several burglaries as oh, a kid. And still, I've been mugged a couple of times. It's awful. And if you can't find the people that did it, you know, the effect on you and the places you think you can and can't go from then on. Yeah. Makes you a bit more nervous. Reminds but... me never to walk back from a gig with you. You seem to be like a very unlucky person. <laughs> very unlucky when it comes person. To, yeah, the opposite of a good luck talisman. So you've been so um as a kid, I'm just crossing over the fact that you've been ever mugged as an adult. Um, <laughs> because who cares about that? No, we do care about that, Matt. But in terms of as a child, so you grew up in a you've had memorable burglaries as a little kid, have you? Oh yeah, there was one in particular where we went on holiday to Skegness, which if you if you live in the East Midlands, that's it's the equivalent of people going to Blackpool if you live in the West Midlands yeah. or the North West. And uh, we came back. I mean, what little we had had basically been taken. And uh, everyone knew it was. Uh, but there was no CCTV. You can't find, you know, you can't prove it. It was just awful. You know, there's something really... Uh, it's a violation, isn't it? It's not so much what oh, they take. Yeah. It's that they've been in, in through all your things with that lack yes, of the respect. Thought of them being in there. And yeah. then they'd, they'd been... They'd put, I can't remember whether I put this in the book or not. But they, <laughs> when we got back, there was still some stuff in a bin bag in the centre of the living room. And like, our house was a tiny terraced house. There wasn't much in it. And uh, my mum, I remember my mum saying to the police, oh, thanks for putting what was left in a bin bag. And said, oh, no, we didn't do that. They did that. They were, they were come due back to come tonight. back with it and yeah. get the rest. But just steadily, every day, just bagged bits up, methodically oh. gone room by room. You're just like, that is cold. And the intrusion yeah. as a child, you know, at night, not knowing. And this is before... CCTV, That's we didn't terrifying. have double blazing. You just think, oh my God, that that sense that someone can invade your property, your person. It wasn't even our property, we rented it, but like your personal space, yeah. your sanctuary. It, it, that sense that actually you're never fully safe. I don't think it's ever really completely left me. 
really and yeah, did absolutely. that and w- when you say you knew who it was I'm not asking you to name them now but w- when you say you knew like you knew in terms of the community who it was or were they people you actually literally knew or knew the kids of or whoever yeah both yeah yeah was... so you actually knew them you might have got been going to school with like one of the kids from that family who did it yeah I mean uh, obviously we didn't see them do it because we weren't there but you know there were rumors and it wouldn't yeah. have been surprising you just think oh man you know this is just utterly miserable you do have, um, I'm going to quote it because I wrote it down because I liked it so much. And this will um, make people have to listen to the audio book so they can hear it done properly. But you said, um, you said, these people even stole my MC Hammer album. One of the most brazen crimes you can commit. The cover even states, you can't touch this. So that was another, um, you've got to hear Matt do that, uh, listeners. Namaste, motherfuckers. I've got a Cameron story for you as well. So wow. I worked at Carlton Television um, in 2000. Oh I joined the very beginning of 2000. I, I ran an independent production company that was bought by Carlton Television. So I ended up at board level at Carlton Television at the same time that Cameron, as some listeners will know, all the ones on your podcast will know, but less on my may know that he did a stint of nearly 10 years as a PR man at Carlton Television. And it was such a weird time because he, it was such a Thatcherite environment. Everybody was, Michael Green was the executive chairman at the time. And he was one of the, you know, Thatcher talked many times about how much she admired Michael Green. Cameron got that job because Sam Cam's mum, Lady Astor, put in a call to Michael Green and said, give him the job. So 27 year old with no experience. Um, this is all on record. I don't think there's going to be a lawsuit me saying this. Um, he, you know, he ends up 27 years old because he thought it would be a good idea to have some experience in the private sector. And he was very typical of the people who were there at the time. They used to have this thing. So they were head, they were they called it Carlton Towers and it was on Knightsbridge. And most of us were just in shitty normal offices. I say shitty, they were in nice locations, but they weren't fancy, you know, offices. Remember them? And then there was so then there was um, Carlton Towers on Knightsbridge. I think it was number one Knightsbridge. And they literally had they had this floor. It was like sort of being in, in the Ritz. And they had um, a private dining room. They had a butler service. I never went in it. I heard talk of it. So there were people living like that. And then they would be cutting costs on, because the programs on Carlton were shit back then. So nothing was making it onto the screen. What was (laughs) it, like bullseye? Because they made quite a lot in Nottingham. Yeah, I mean, I should be careful what I say, because I did, um, part of what's paid for this house is that I had that job. Catchphrase. Yeah, Supermarket suite. Yeah, uh, that's how I know Nottingham a bit. That and the fact I used to skydive at Langer Airfield that's near, <laughs> near Nottingham. Um, you, you'll never have a conversation like this again, Matt. I'm, I'm sure you're glad about that. But it was. But it's interesting when you think about, again, what struck me with thinking about these sort of polarised parts of politics is that how do you then, if I at somebody at board level found it incredibly hard to have a voice, when someone had said to me, you're at the same level as these guys, have a voice, but I felt silenced. Mm. It does make me wonder with the kind of cronyism and, you know, nepotism and all the crap that's going on in the Tory party right now, how the tide is going to turn, because how do you get a voice when you're so scared? I mean, what, I, know, I know you're not as, as invested in the Tory party in terms of your politics, but what's your view about how we're going to get out of this um, pickle that we're in? I think it will take a, a, a Tory defeat at a general election and that that requires <laughs> Labour to, to sort its house out. Because the local elections didn't go so well, did they? No, they weren't very badly. Mm. Um, and and Labour has a lot of work to do to, to win the next I mean, I think we win the next election. Are, win you the a Starmer, next. are you a Starmer supporter? I mean, I guess he's certainly much better than what's gone before re- in recent years. Yes, and I think it's the first time Labour can say for 10 years they've finally got a candidate who's better to be Prime Minister than the person who's currently doing the job. And I think in time, I think the country will probably agree. I think the problem Starmer has isn't Keir Starmer, it's the Labour Party. Is mm. is the relationship with the Labour Party is, is for millions of people gone beyond breaking point and they are people that used to vote for it, mm. often in its heartlands. Mm. Its most treasured loyal supporters can no longer vote for it. This is, it is on life support. So that, I think that's how you change things. I, I have to say where my experience in politics was, was perhaps different to yours at board level was that particularly when Tony Blair ran the Labour Party, it was very open. Mm-hmm. and every problem was taken seriously and they really valued input mm-hmm. from literally anyone and wanted more of it 
and did everything they possibly could. That ref- I, that was reflecting the way that they ran the country and the way they ran the party. They really wanted to, you know, they got huge amounts of power out of Whitehall and set the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly and got Stormont going again. You know, they were so keen to just involve people in everything. Mm-hmm. They didn't go anywhere near far enough, but obviously in the end they, they were on limited time. But it was also the, w- the way, for all its faults, for all the problems that I encountered, the way that new around the party really was exceptional mm-hmm. and it attracted really good people mm-hmm. in every regard talented people and and uh you know morally sound people and but passionate people people who would do whatever it took for the for the kind of cause because they believed in it yes and they you know what there was something about and and i and i think he deserves real credit for this there was a personality type about tony blair mm-hmm. that i think for for when the country liked him they totally saw it which was that this was a, a, a really talented bloke, but he was open. You, mm-hmm. you could chat to him, he was informal. and He knew how to get on with people in a very basic way that loads of people can't, and particularly lots of politicians can't, which is quite, it beggars belief, really, when you think what their job is. Yeah, but that ran through the whole organisation. Yeah, the, yeah. the whole machine was then sort of imbued with that. Mm-hmm. that. That tone was set from the top, and not everyone followed suit. And obviously there were people in there that, that were working to get to get rid of him, you know, such is the nature of politics. But it had an effect. And when he left, some of that went. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just think, you know, that's the huge difference that individuals can make. And what needs they... to happen, because if, I mean, we understand this conceptually and directionally and ideologically, we are in a pretty depressing kind of point in history I was interested in your book thinking how are you going to craft a kind of upbeat ending out of this and um and it was your your podcast you talked about the political party and you know starting that in 2013 and it being the way to have your voice and look at more nuanced politics and anyone who hasn't listened to it, it's a really really interesting probably one of the more balanced sort of political conversations you'll, you'll hear at the moment so as well as listening to the political party, uh, what, what, what can people do at the moment that might help? So anyone listening to this, if they're thinking, yeah, I'm totally disenfranchised too, what, what do we do? The first thing you have to do, the, the first thing that everyone really can do is register to vote and make mm-hmm. sure that you vote. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to vote for a particular party. I spoiled my ballot in 2017 because I couldn't bring myself to vote Labour in a general election for the first time in my life. And I have voted in literally every election that I'm eligible to vote mm-hmm. in. I've never missed a council by election, a referendum, mm-hmm. the lot. I love it. Um, and I realise that makes me a bit of a freak, but you register to vote. And that does a number of things. Firstly, um, register, you know, if you can't bring yourself to vote for a party, which isn't that, you know, a lot of people are going to feel like that at the moment. Mm-hmm. Putting in a blank ballot paper is completely different to just not voting. Mm-hmm. Because for yourself, you're making the effort to get off your backside or at least go to the post box to say, I care about what happens to my area mm-hmm. and I care what happens to my country. And part of what makes a democracy function is in the hands of citizens. It mm-hmm. is up to us. It is incumbent on all of us to play our part. It's not mm-hmm. just enough to say sometimes, are oh, the politicians? Because I guarantee you there'll be election results where people will have sat at home and gone, ah, oh, fuck, I wish I'd have voted. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. that's Brexit, I guarantee you there will be tons of people that will have gone, fuck, why didn't I go out and vote? Mm. And had the result been the other way, there would have been a whole load of people on the other side that would have felt the same. Mm -hmm. And the same after the Clinton defeat um, against Trump, I think the same thing, wasn't it? People like, if only I'd voted. Can you imagine? So you have to do that so that you've done your bit. Because actually en masse, and crucially, the more people vote, the more politicians have to come to your door. Now, in defence of politicians and political parties... They are trying to get around everyone with scarce resources. Mm. And inevitably, in an election campaign, you, you, you target those resources on the people that vote for you because you need those people to come out and vote for mm. you. And maybe then a bit of guesswork on who might. So your role as a citizen is to give that data to the local authority that says, mm-hmm. oh, this person votes. Political parties then get something after an election called a marked register. They mm-hmm. don't know who you voted for, but they know that you're a voter. Mm-hmm. So they go, okay, this is someone whose door we need to get mm-hmm. on the knocker of or on the phone number. Doesn't so you're giving them a steer it. as to what's actually going on in a temperature check rather than just a blank. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and just for your own personal satisfaction, be a person that votes. 
even if you put in a blank ballot paper. And you can, by the way, as I send a book, you can spoil your ballot paper. You can draw a cock and balls yeah. on it. You can write swear words on it, all that type of this thing. This is exactly what I've been telling my kids since they were tiny. I was like, knee high to a grasshopper, kids, draw a cock and ball on, balls on your yeah. ballot paper. They're quite politicised, I think, that generation, because they were old enough. One of my kids um, was nearly 18 um, when the Brexit vote happened, and the other one was 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 three, three and still is three years younger. But they both were so pissed off that they didn't get a chance to vote. Yeah. And it's actually if one thing's come out of Brexit is that I think a lot of kids that age will never ever not vote again because they're so horrified. My kids are half Dutch. Their dad lives over here, not married to anyone English. He's it's ridiculous. You know they're personally quite affected by it. I mean they've got two yeah. passports, but I, you know I don't. Their dad doesn't. And I think it has probably a little too too little too late. But that generation I think may not. Take voting for granted no and i think i think brexit and then the pandemic will, will have huge uh, implications for how for for our political future the other thing is i think if you can stomach it and you care enough about one of them join a political party mm. and be a sensible voice could you not run for office uh, matt you seem like somebody who might be quite good if you decided to no, throw I'd your be, hat in the ring I, i'd be terrible and, and and one of the things about being in politics is there aren't enough people who realize how terrible they'd be at it it's really hard and I think I don't have the right mix of things that would make a good politician. And also, I think politics is... Re- I mean, I get enough shit as it is on social media yeah. without, without yeah. inviting more. And I just think... You know, I was on Politics Live this week, the week that we recorded this. And, you know, you can make a perfectly reasonable point and uh, you get absolutely monstered. Well, also, uh, they can take things out. I, w- I was talking to Jeff Norcott about this, and they just take the terrifying thing is they can not they can take stuff out of context. We know this happens, but it is terrifying when you think that one thing you say or that little thing that goes viral that was only a tenth of the sentence, and then yeah. everyone's like, I can't believe you said that about vaccinations. You're like, and I didn't. But it, but even if, even if they show an unedited, reasonable clip, people will interpret people all sorts of things shit. from it, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's more, for me, it's more that actually is, my experience is more that no matter how reasonable you are, no matter how in control you are of what you're saying, you're going to be vilified. You'll get vilified for it. Mm. So I just think that puts, you know, if people look at that, particularly young people coming through now and go, why on earth would anyone sane go into politics if this is what it's like? I know it's, it's and that is particularly put, women. Yeah. You'd just be like, fuck this. Yeah. I'm not getting involved in that. I want to go and do something that doesn't involve me being a hate figure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you get all the same amount of shit you get in a big corporate job, but with also the public turning on you every which way. And we are so divided at the moment. I mean, it is terrifying and it's so easy, isn't it, to hate on people. Yeah, I do. Who defends, who's defending politicians? You know, they do a difficult job. It's really hard. They're publicly accountable. Um, their failures are far more remembered than any of their successes. And most of them, the vast majority of people in the House of Commons and in Holyrood and in the Senate in Cardiff, and in councils up and down the country, just what are trying to make the world a better place. They disagree on what making it a better place is, but that is where the vast majority of them in mainstream politics are coming from. And I think as a public, we've occasionally, or, or wholesale, feels like we've lost sight of what they're there for and what One they're One of the touching by. bits in your book was um, your kind of, I was going to say your love affair with Tessa Jowell. You didn't literally have a love oh, affair, no. but your admiration. I actually live, so geographically, if you drew a triangle, you would have around my house, you would have where Tessa Jowell used to live, um, you'd have Ed Miliband and you'd have Keir Starmer. I live right wow. in the middle of an equidistant triangle. Sort of Bermuda triangle. It, exactly. I used to go to a road with Tessa Jowell. But um, yeah, it's that was the, so. So it's and it is lovely to hear. That's one of the other lovely things that I, about your book was the sort of yeah that the celebrate some of the characters in it and to hear things like that about somebody like her. I thought was really really important, especially if we're looking at female role models in in politics. And she was one, and it's very sad she's not still here. But so as not to end on a on a bum note. <laughs> Um, I do. I, I've got. Um, I've got three questions that I always ask everybody. But just before I ask you those, um, I can't have interviewed you and not mentioned um, what you do as an impressionist. So I'm sure everybody knows uh, knows that you do that. Um, you've obviously uh, you're known as uh, you know you do splitting image. You're you, you've you've been on the Royal Variety performance. So what got you into? Was it trying to be popular at school that got you into doing voices, or how how did you get into them? I got I got into them. I mean, I guess. <laughs> If you start doing comedy at school, then I, I guess there's an element of that. Because you were 16 that, when you did your first gig. Did my first gig at 16. Yeah. It was before that. I was obsessed with football and still am. And uh, I, I think I realised... I talk to you about that. That's why we're talking about politics and comedy. <laughs> I've got I nothing realized, on football. <laughs> I realised pretty quickly I wasn't good enough to be a footballer, even at a young age. 
But I loved the way, and this sounds really basic, but I, I've got a real thing for sounds, and I love the way that some people sound. And I think actually in politics, there's something quite important about that. And I think politics, you know, politicians do think about the way they sound, and perhaps they should. Not that they should put on new voices, but I think, you know, I, I, one sound I really like is Nick Robinson on the Today programme in the morning. Mm -hmm. And he has that kind of husky way of speaking. The Prime Minister announced <laughs> late last night that he will be lifting restrictions. And you think <laughs> that voice absolutely suits that job. And he's... Yeah. The way he describes and paints stories about politics uses his voice in that way. So even as a kid, I loved one of my favorite things is uh, when life is normal, when there's big England games on, like at a World Cup or a Euro, I was going to a big pub. And I love the way before kickoff, when the commentary's on, but you can't quite hear it, everything's echoing. And there are some commentators' voices that really echo like that. It's it's D-Day for Gareth Southgate and these men who face Germany. And there's just something about the resonance of that <laughs> yeah. sound. You go, this is what this should sound like. There's a there's a reason why snooker commentate. You can't commentate on snooker like that. You know, it has to have that kind of more, oh, where's the cue ball going? It has that whispering <laughs> way. You know, cricket commentary suits cricket. Boxing commentary really suits boxing. Digs in deep. Goes upstairs. He's ready to finish him <laughs> off here. Oh, my word. It's a grandstand finish. For AJ and like it, I mean, uh, uh, even as a kid, I thought, oh, there's something in the commentators are adding something to this. So it was more that I used to impersonate people like John Motson and and yeah. players. So rather than uh, and obviously I did try and recreate goals on the park, but I I loved the way that particularly commentators sounded. So John Motson I think was the first, and he has one of those voices, <laughs> very specific, but it has that resonance in it. It's the <laughs> FA Cup final, and you just think. There's a magic in that, and I loved that. So that's what got me into impressions. So I would just do them, and then I would impersonate teachers and whoever was on telly and things. And then as my um, obsession with politics grew, I guess I would just impersonate whatever you're watching and whatever you're taking in. In, in the same way, I think it's the same for any comedian or creative your references in your set will be things that you've watched. Yeah, and things you're you know, in, and things you're absorbed in. And you have, course. I mean, it is a rich gift. So on Spitting Image, you're, is it right that you're Trump, Johnson, Starmer and David Furnish? Is that right? I don't think, no, I don't do David Furnish. No, I don't know where that came that, from. That's well. Let's say you do, because I thought that was, okay. um, that was a nice sort of... <laughs> a nice but, yeah, one. Yeah, um, yeah, that's interesting. So um, I think I put that on your Wikipedia page. I'll take it down Thank if you, you want. Uh, <laughs> so, but Boris, I mean, that's a rich gift, Boris Johnson in terms of I've seen you doing your, a lot of your Boris Johnson stuff I mean that's a fabulous thing to be able to do at the moment isn't it that's a, that's a, a little gleaming ray of uh, light a silver lining to a dark cloud having your, your Boris Johnson impression he's a gift uh, talking completely unpolitically and purely just as a comedy performer having to impersonate someone his the character that he has created oh, brilliant. is a great basis to, to kind of take that character elsewhere. And of course, the voice is so distinctive. His mannerisms are so uh, big and uh, you know, all the you know, all the kind of expansive, <laughs> stupid noises that he makes. And then noises that I think with him and Trump, what's great is they're people that you can invent new noises for that people would actually imagine their noises that they would make. And, and, and <laughs> you're then kind of just enjoying a silly voice. I mean, with Boris, there are so many, because uh, obviously very... very uh, will uh, will spoken, and that he does that kind of fake sincere thing. You know, Cameron would 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 always do it. No, and I I do, and I I do bloody care actually. And I, I think it's bloody well important, and it never quite felt real. You know, Blair was always better at if he didn't care. Certainly acting like he did. Yeah. You know, very good actually, Callie. <laughs> at the big stuff. Yes, it's right that as a government, look, this isn't just about investment, actually. This is about what it says about us as a country. What do we prioritise? And for too long, frankly, you go, wow, this is like big, yeah. big, big. And, uh, you know, um, so, so in contrast, Boris, a, a lot of it is, is affected. And you'll do those things where he's kind of silly for a bit and then he realises, oh, I need to kind of be serious. Go, oh, well, come on. You need and even 
when I do him now, I kind of look around as he does. You know, I kind of yeah. physically sort of become him. Yes, he is oh, quite yeah. comedic, isn't he? He is quite. I mean, if he was a comedian, he'd be a lot less dangerous. But he has got that. He does. Yeah. He does have. I don't know how good he'd be, but he does have a capacity to make people laugh. He is charismatic, if very, very fucking dangerous for the country. Well, uh, uh, come on, you know, he often starts uh, kind of offended by the oh come on, Cali, you, you Cali beaten of the namaste <laughs> I, I dare not re- 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 repeat uh, the, the, the second word such is it is, is, is offense that it may may cause to the snowflake generation or indeed other uh, people who, who uh, consume this podcast who do that in slow right I'll down be putting and really that out so people it. think I've had him on <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna quadruple my numbers <laughs> it's um no it is a real uh it, it, it's also a real joy I'm a real um obsessive about the late night monologue Stephen Colbert Seth Meyers oh, Jimmy yeah. Kimmel to a lesser extent I used to work on the Colbert show and the daily <gasps> show so I've always wow. and I worked with Comedy Central so I'm a massive fan of those things and actually I kind of wish wish we had those kind of things. It's made a lot of sense of the world, certainly during the Trump administration. I used to watch every single late night monologue there was, yeah. um, three or four, you know, four nights a week whenever they were not on a break. And it really helped me through it. And I think in a way, the sort of things you're doing are the nearest we have over here. You're, you're doing something comedic that is giving us a little bit of hope that there's something to be redeemed. And there's a common voice and feeling that what we're going through is really bloody weird and needs to change. Well, I think... Um... You know, I did four series on Dave of, of a show called Unspun that was effectively that, was a British daily show. And uh, we've just had the MASH report on the BBC. Mm. There is no good reason why those shows shouldn't have continued and why Colbert uh, and, and Trevor Noah and Jon Stewart and what those people do can't work here. And there's no reason why those hosts can't just not be blokes. <laughs> There's no reason why those things can't work here at all. Britain has a proud satirical history. Have I got news for you has run for, what, more than 30 years now? Yeah, Spitting yeah. Image has just come back. There's a huge market for it. There's a huge market here for those American shows. Yeah. So I think broad, they're the sorts of shows that broadcasters really have to stick with over a long period they of do. time. They do. They take a long time to build. And we used to, I mean, that's what I did at Viacom was I, I worked on trying to get their shows around the world as formats, you know, get get the format out or the, or the um, you know, original American version. And it was Great. so hard selling that as a, I mean, even getting it over here, it was on, I think it was Channel 4. They used to license the Daily Show from us. And even they didn't even take the US version, which had incredible names on. So had John Oliver as a correspondent back then. It was an incredibly well-made show. And it, they just said there wasn't an appetite for it. So I I do personally have a real passion for whatever we do in the comedic world that has any of that in it. I don't think there is enough of it. And coming very much from an American comedic and television culture, as I do from my career, I, I really value it over here. Namaste, motherfuckers. What would you pick as your namaste, motherfucking, life-changing moment? Well, I guess there are quite a few. And I think, I'm not sure I could boil... I'm not sure I could say there were defining individual moments that have led me to particular things. But if if there was one, this is such an incredible story. Uh, So me and John Richardson, who's another great comedian, uh, periodically go to New York. We try and go every, we always said we'd try and go once a year. We we do it every month, every month or two years around Christmas and uh, we just love it. We go there. And now, we've been a few times, so now we just basically... It's a five-day pub crawl around New York, and it's uh, fantastic. The first time we went... Um, so he just started doing eight out of ten cats, I think. So he was getting a bit of profile in the in the UK. And uh, we're over there on the piss. And uh, I was a comedian as well, and I was writing for him on these shows. And So, you yeah, know, he was doing very well, and I was doing okay. We are you know, two young lads, happy with life. And uh, we used to play a, a, a game called... And people would have played versions of this, the lookalike game. So if we're on the train, you'd go, oh, bloke over there looks like a, a tall Les Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> that bloke over there looks like, uh, you know, a short, tiny Blair. Or she looks like, uh, you know, an old Margaret Thatcher or whatever it was. And you go, oh, yeah, that's quite good. We're in downtown Manhattan <laughs> towards the end of our trip. And uh, John goes, uh, oh, he looks like Billy Connolly. <laughs> I said, that is Billy Connolly. 
<laughs> and I'm the sort of, per- and we are opposites in this regard. John is the sort of person who would never approach someone in the street. I'm the sort of person that just approaches them and doesn't even think about what I'm going to say. And I went, Billy Connolly. And Billy, it's Billy Connolly, the greatest stand up that's ever lived. Yeah. And we've bumped into this guy who's from our, the same tiny little island as us. And we've bumped into him in Manhattan. He turns around, he's radiant. He goes, hey, as a. I said, oh my God. I said, Billy, we're, we're, um, we're comedians from, from Britain. We're both massive fans of yours. He goes, oh, great. He goes, um, what's, what are you doing over here? Are you, are you over here, gang? We're like, oh, no, no, we're, we're just on the piss. What are you doing tonight? I said, oh, we're just about to go and see the Ghostbusters fire station. <laughs> he goes, you've got to go to Caroline's near Times Square. It's great. They're doing new material there. You'd love it. We're like, all right, okay, yeah, yeah. And then it was one of those things where you go, <laughs> Fucking hell, we've stopped Billy Connolly in the street. <laughs> so, so, Billy, I'm so sorry. We'll let you go. He goes, oh, not at all. He gave us... Pep Talk doesn't do justice to this, the impact of his words and the thoughtfulness. So he says, um, he starts asking us how we're doing in jungles. I've just started doing panel shows, you know. It's, he goes, don't apologise for that. <laughs> he goes, you're in a city full of, of, of comedians that are waiting tables. Saying I'd never take that gig. It's because they don't get offered it. You've got to pay your bills first, then you can make the thing you want to make. All this thing, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> We're now in like hungover, like in the street being given. It's the, you know, now I see these adverts on YouTube periodically for things like Masterclass or whatever yeah. they're called. You're like, we got that from the yeah. greatest in the street. So then, and then we're like, oh, Billy, uh, we'll let you go, mate. We're, I'm really sorry. Goes, oh, not at all. And don't forget, by the way, and just starts giving us basically. The, all this wisdom, all this knowledge, delivered by Billy Connolly. And uh, we're like, Billy, you know, right at the end, we're just like, oh, mate, I, I really feel like... We get a photo with him. I'm, I'm kicking myself I didn't get his autograph. Anyway, um, we walk off. We, we go our separate directions. And then John is, like, visibly shaken, and we're just like, what the fuck? We're just walking down the street in Manhattan going, what the fuck? Just, he then shouts after us. He goes, boys, boys, it'll happen. It'll happen. Oh, that's actually made me feel quite moved. Well, cheers, Billy. Thanks for it. We're like, wow, wow. the PS is this amazing. That is he amazing. just thought, oh, you know, he, he, he needed to give us that extra. And that's the bit that I, oh. you know, and in the immediate aftermath of that, we're like, fuck, we let Billy come. He gives us this amazing thing. Boys, boys, it will happen. You know, like, whoa. And then in time, obviously, you tell everyone when you get back, you're not going to believe this. And then I guess like any story like that, you kind of forget about it. And then, so it was nearly 10 years ago. A few months ago, after I moved house, I found an old laptop, plugged it in, and all these old photos of this trip were on there. Now, photos of Billy Connolly were on there. I was like, oh, because I thought I'd lost them. I thought it was just on an old phone and I'd never get them back. And uh, it all came back. And now I'm like, I don't think even then, in, in the peak of our excitement, in the immediate aftermath of that encounter, I don't think we really appreciated actually w- what a profound thing he did for us that day. And That's I just think amazing. periodically, I think. Fuck, you know, I wonder if in a way that has played a part subconsciously in keeping me going. At that times, is amazing. Thinking, he, you know, um, incredible. Uh, and his, and yeah, watching his stuff lately since he's had Parkinson's, I felt so emotional every time I've seen any of his, well, anything, anytime I've ever seen anything of his, which is everything. I've saw yeah. everything he's ever done. I find it so devastating what's happening with him. And I can't bear to think, people say I can't bear to think David Attenborough will ever die. I can't bear to think Billy Connolly will ever, ever die. He, he's the one who said um, a, a, a comedian is not a person on stage saying funny things. It's a funny person on stage saying things. Oh. And isn't that, isn't that just sum it up? He is. He is one of those people that is a mix of so many th- things, and he makes it look easy. He does, and, and he's so yeah, and physically so. But yes, before we um before we wet our pants over Billy Connolly, which we could easily do, I need to ask you. Um, and thank you for that. That was an absolutely lovely Namaste motherfucking moment, <laughs> top of the Namaste motherfucking charts. Um, <laughs> what's your favourite joke? They're all t- all my my top hundred jokes. I think would all be Tim Vine jokes. And the one that I remember more than any other is all tennis players are witches. Look at Goran. Even he's a witch. 
<laughs> and I think about, I must think about that joke at least once a week. <laughs> and I think I first saw him tell it in about 1999. <laughs> so, oh, it's such a great, because you know what's happened is he's heard Goran Ivanisovic and thought, Ivanisovic, <laughs> and then gone backwards. You're like, all tennis players aren't witches. It's such a silly <laughs> damn joke. Even, even he, like, that's what makes me laugh about it. It's like, they've got them all now, Andy Murray. <laughs> like, even <laughs> Even Goran. I just love how much it does with such a small amount of words. And what would you, if there's one bit of life advice, you gave us advice that you would give to people wanting to do something to improve the landscape politically. But if there was one bit of life advice you could give to anybody listening, what would it be? Celebrate the victories, however small, because you'll always regret it if you didn't. You'll always think, oh, we should have gone for a pint then or had a glass of champagne or something, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be career, it can be personal, it can be anything. Because so much of life is work and bills and stress and fear that when something good does happen, I think sometimes people don't quite process it. And it, it doesn't have to be something massive, but enjoy it at that point because the further you get away from it, you go, well, I can't celebrate it now. So don't be immodest in, uh, in, in, in celebrating whatever it is, however you define a victory. I think at that point, you should treat yourself whether it's to a beer or to, you know, a pack of stickers or whatever it is you collect. I'm going to have, um, nice I'm going to have a, a pint of cider because my son has unloaded the dishwasher. Uh, so that's, yes. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and I should say we're, we're recording this at 8 a.m. Uh, so um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Matt. Thank you. That was the mega talented and lovely human Matt Ford. Every episode, I pick a thing inspired by my guest that I am going to try. This week, I'm going to do something Matt says in his book everyone should do at least once in their lives, and that's go to the public gallery in the House of Commons. We'll put a link in the show notes, but the galleries are apparently open to the public from Monday to Thursday, and it's free. You just rock up, although apparently you should be prepared to queue. Um, And if you want to go to Prime Minister's Questions, you do need a ticket. So look at me looking like I know what I'm talking about. Namaste, motherfuckers, was written and presented by me, Callie Beaton, and was produced by Mike Hansen and Karu Shadami for Pod People Productions. Music by Jake Yap. If you've liked today's show, please subscribe now on your favourite podcast app and also rate and review the show, not because I'm needy and crave external affirmation, but because it helps other people find the show. So that's the show for this week. Thanks to Matt for joining me. You can find links to his website, social media and all his other good stuff in the show notes. We'll be back in your feed next Monday when I'll be talking to comedy producer, presenter and writer of shows, including The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Black Adder and QI, John Lloyd. I carried this around for 40 years. Every time I thought of school, I was full of fear and anger and it was all gone. So that was amazing. I'm Callie Beaton. Until next time, motherfuckers. Namaste, motherfuckers. Pod people.